Good morning, church family. When Pastor Garrett asked me if I would be interested in teaching one Sunday morning, I was filled with excitement, honor, and fear. <laughs> Before I begin, I want to tell you all that I am acutely aware of the privilege and responsibility that I have to speak the truth in grace this morning. This morning, we are going to wrestle with the concept of suffering as we study James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Before I begin, I want to point out that I am a child on this topic in comparison to many of you. Although I've experienced much suffering in my short 22 years on this earth, it is small in comparison to the decades of suffering many of you have had to endure. So I hope that you'll bear with me as I attempt to shed light on what God has for us this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you broken, hurting, and suffering. God, we often run to things to cover up our pain or to cope with our pain. I pray that you would help us to see that you are the only way that we can truly endure suffering. I pray that you would be with us this morning. I pray that you would guide us. I pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes and our ears to hear you, to see you, and to feel you this morning. I pray that when I speak that we will hear you and not Noah. I pray that I will not try to push myself forward, but I will push you forward. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When I first read this passage, I was overwhelmed. I immediately had a plethora of questions about suffering. And when I studied, I had even more points that I wanted to make on it. I tried to fit them all in my first, in my second, in my third, in my fourth draft, and it just wasn't possible. Although there are so many incredible things that can be said on suffering, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that I was able to narrow it down to three main questions <laughs> and three main points that I want to address this morning. The questions are, why would a good God allow suffering? Why would we be joyful amidst suffering? And what can suffering do to us? Why would a good God allow suffering? I quote. I still hear the screams, Noah. I see the blood. I feel the fear. I hear the gunshots. When I sleep, I dream of him. Every second of pain is a reminder of the fear in their eyes as they slipped into the night. Noah, they were mothers and fathers. They were sons and daughters. I watched as husbands called their wives and said, I love you for the last time. I saw dead children laying in puddles of blood. I gritted my teeth and I shook with anger as my oldest sister, Bonnie Kate, spoke to me of the horrors she experienced that dark night in Aurora, Colorado. She was shot in the knee at the midnight premiere of Batman in a mass shooting July 12th, July 19th, 2012. She will never run, jump, or dance again. I was 15 years old the first time I truly became aware of the suffering and darkness and evil of this world, and I have wrestled with this difficult reality ever since. What is the point? Why, God? Where were you? I was furious with God for a very long time, 
until I presented my question to one of my high school teachers in attempts to stump him and justify my anger and my hatred towards God. I approached my teacher and I said, how could a good and perfect God allow such suffering to those he loves? If he loves us, if he truly loves us, why would he permit us to such pain and such evil? My professor looked at me and he said, I'll answer your question when you ask it the right way. As you can imagine, this made me furious, but it made me think. As time went on, I continued to think of different ways to present my question, and I did. I presented it to him, and his response was always the same. I'll answer your question when you present it the right way. Eventually, I lost my patience and I demanded that he explain to me what the right way was to ask this question. And he looked at me once again, and he graciously said, the question is not, how could a good and perfect God allow suffering? The question is, how could a good and perfect God allow anything but suffering to those who deserve it? As you can imagine, this didn't quite do the trick for me. I was still frustrated. I didn't, I didn't understand this question, and it made me angry more than anything else. But it pushed me, and I started to see the false assumptions that I had been making. My first assumption was that I don't deserve to suffer. When G.K. Chesterton was asked to give a response on the problem of the world, he responded with a letter that read, Dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. Romans 5, chapter, Romans chapter 5, verse 12 reads, Therefore, just as one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. We have all sinned. We are fallen, we are broken, and when we are truly honest with ourselves, when we really look at ourselves for who we are, we see that we are only deserving of suffering and sin. We run towards the things that hurt us, and we run towards the things that hurt those around us. My second assumption was that if God had a good reason for allowing suffering, then I deserve to know it. Have you ever been used? Has someone pretended to be your friend to get to someone else? Has someone pretended to be your friend until they could no longer get what they wanted from you and then they dropped you? We so often treat God this way. When we experience suffering, we try to come up with reasons or things God is teaching us in the moment, things that he is teaching us through it. The difficult reality is that most of the time, God doesn't show us why. He doesn't let us know what we are doing. He doesn't let us know what He is doing. We so often love God and serve God, not for who He is, but for what He is giving us. We love things for what we can get from them. And when we do this, we not only crush others, but we dehumanize ourselves. The only way to know that we are serving God truly for who He is is to be in a position where serving Him doesn't actually give you anything you can see. The only way that we can love unconditionally and fully the way Christ has loved us is to suffer and not know why. Is to be in a position where suffering is the only thing that we feel. God doesn't always give us a reason why so that we can serve Him and love Him for who He is and not for what we are using Him to gain. We have to to learn how to love people for who they are in themselves. And we have to learn how to love God for who He is in Himself. And the only way to do this is through suffering. As more time passed, 
I began to see the pride in my assumptions. Tim Keller revealed to me in his book, The Reasons for God, that if I had a God that was great enough to rid the world of sin and suffering and death, then in the same moment, I had a God who was great enough to have a good reason for allowing it to continue that is above my understanding. If God is transcendent enough to rid the world of sin, is he not transcendent enough to have a good reason for allowing it to continue that's above our understanding? Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 read, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Although suffering began to make sense to me, it did not seem worth it. I understood why I didn't understand it, but I was far from content with it and even further from being joyful in it. Which leads me to my next point. Why would, a good, why would we be joyful amidst suffering? In verse 1, James tells us to count it all joy, my brothers, when we meet trials of various kinds. How is this possible? Really? Someone I love died. Count it all joy? I have no true or loyal friends. Count it all joy? They broke up with me. Count it all joy? My family is so unhealthy and so broken. Count it all joy? I can't quit the thing that I know hurts me. Count it all joy? I'm treated horribly simply because of what I look like. Count it all joy? I've been abused and I'll never be the same. Count it all joy? I don't feel you at all, God. My life is a mess and I don't know what to do. Count it all joy? I looked inward and I looked outward and all I could see was pain and death and suffering, saying such as, God's ways are not your ways, or God's got a plan, or count it all joy, only made me more bitter and more angry. Why was this not good enough for me? Why do we become so angry with God when things go wrong? Why do we keep running to the things that we know don't matter in the long run? I believe the answer is simple. And it reaches all the way back to the garden. We believe Satan's lie that our God doesn't really love us. We believe his lie. He tells us, if you give yourself fully and utterly to God, he will crush you. You won't be happy. You won't be content. You can't trust him. You will lose everything. He doesn't love you. I knew in my head that God loved me, but in my heart of hearts, I did not believe it. The reason that I can't handle suffering and that I couldn't handle suffering is that I believed Satan's lie. I didn't believe that my father loved me, cherished me, would carry me through, would take care of me, even though I didn't see him and I didn't feel him. I didn't believe he loved me. So how do we know? How do we know that our God loves us? What we need to handle suffering is proof that our God loves us and will take care of us and will cherish us no matter what. How do we know? We know because there was another who cried out, why God, why? There was another who was alone and beaten and forsaken. There was another who suffered relentlessly without an answer to why. The only innocent sufferer. The only truly forsaken. Jesus Christ 
was the only one to serve God fully and for nothing. He was the only one who God said, give me everything and I will crush you. Satan is a liar because our God did that for us. He loved us just for who we are. He didn't get anything out of it. He had all power. He had all glory. He had all majesty. And he gave it up to take the pain and the suffering and the death that you feel and that you inflict and that you cause every single day. He took the suffering that we deserve. That is our proof. And when you know the extent that He loves you, suffering doesn't pull you away from joy. It pushes you deeper into it. Christ's love revealed to me that my castles were built on sinking sand. The security I had in my family, in my community, in my strength, in my wisdom was gone. My golden calves melted in the fire of suffering. And I started to see the vanity of my pursuits. When I put my hope in things, losing them caused me to lose my joy. But when I put my hope in Him, losing things pushed me closer to Him and closer to my source of joy. I tried so hard to find my joy in relationships I tried so hard to find my joy in work. I tried so hard to find my joy in money, in status, in alcohol, in family, in things. And I was always left wanting. No matter how many things I had, none of them made life worth living when I encountered true suffering. I was looking for God in everything but Him. G.K. Chesterton famously said, every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. Suffering showed me that I had been knocking on the wrong doors to find the joy that I so desperately needed. In losing what I thought I could not live without, I gained the only thing worth living for. A father. A friend. A God who suffers with me and for me. And I only found true joy when I had nothing else but Him. My last point is what can suffering do to us? Suffering is a powerful force that either brings forth life or death. When we suffer without faith, we become hardened, bitter, and resentful. We shift the blame. When we suffer without Christ, our innocent desires become sinful and eventually destructive. When our desires are not met, we suffer. And, we su- and when we suffer without believing that our God loves us, hunger becomes gluttony, sexual desire becomes lust, and the need for money becomes greed. It's like we are drowning, and in a panic, we drown those around us. Impatiently, we breathe in water instead of allowing ourselves to be brought to the surface because we do not believe God loves us, because we do not believe God will carry us through. We breathe water instead of oxygen. We swim deeper into the source of our pain and we become shells of who we could be. Although suffering can lead you to death and can create a monster in you, It is not the only way. And it is never too late. In verses 3 through 4, James tells us because you know that the testing of your faith 
produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When we refuse to believe the lie of Satan, when we refuse to suffer without believing that our God loves us, when we refuse to breathe in water even though we just need some air, when we suffer with faith, something incredible happens. You become who you were made to be. You gain a joy that no death, that no pain, that no suffering, that no loss can take away. You become a person with purpose. You become a part of something that is so much greater than yourself. You begin to see how much you cost Him. And His love for you becomes tangible and it becomes real because you got a glimpse of the suffering, of the pain, of the unmet desires, of the loss that He endured for you. He took the breath of water so that we could get the oxygen. So that we could know joy in all things. So that we could become mature and perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So that we could know the love that surpasses understanding, that is not based on what you have to offer, but is based on who you are. We worship a God that allows us to lose what we think we cannot live without, that we may gain the only thing worth living for. I'm going to say that one more time. We worship a God who allows us to lose what we think we cannot live without, that we may gain the only thing worth living for. We worship a God who lost it all, that you may have it all. We worship a God who suffered brutally for us and because of us. So when we suffer, may we not become hardened and bitter and resentful. May we not shift the blame May we not believe Satan's lies. May we not run to our idols. May we not choose the path to sin and death and destruction and more suffering. But may we become steadfast, joyful, and complete. May we take the blame that we may see His love in taking it from us. May we run to Him. May we cling to Him. May we trust in Him. He wept for us. He bled for us. He suffered for us. So may we count it all joy, my brothers, when we meet trials of various kinds. For we know the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that we may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much um, that You meet us where we are in our suffering, um, in our pain, in our loss. God, I pray that you would, um, you would help us to cling to you as we meet trials and not to the things that we cling to to try to numb out our pain. God, I pray that you would be with us. I pray that you would guide us. I pray that you would strengthen us. And I pray that you would help us as we encourage one another to suffer with faith. God, I pray that you would, um, you would be near to us. Um, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for giving me words to say. Um, I thank you that you have brought me here, um, for it is truly a miracle that I stand here in church um, preaching your word, Lord. Thank you that you have brought me back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.